Okay. Good morning again. Um, I'm delighted to introduce Kirk, who's going to be talking about microplate and the Internet of Things and the three pound device. I've just seen his first slide, which has got the joke that I was, I was going to make. Uh, <laughs> so I won't, won't, won't do that, uh, Kirk. Cool. Everyone hear me okay? So, uh, unfortunately, since I wrote the title, Brexit's happened, uh, which means the pound's weaker and everything's more expensive, so it's actually now uh, the four-pound device. <laughs> but you get the picture. So let me take you back to 2012. We've got some memories. There was the Olympics. There was some Queen thing that happened. Uh, they found the Higgs boson. And you didn't need to get up to turn your light on anymore because Philips brought out their Hue. Uh, launched at the amazingly unaffordable price of £179 for just three light bulbs, uh, it changed the world. I don't know about you, but my house looks just like that. Um, <laughs> but after years of announcements for fridges with computers in them and, and stuff like that, it was something that people would actually relate to for a change, because we can all see the point of not having to get up to turn the light bulbs on. So but despite sort of vague predictions of gross retracking fridges and automatic ordering and stuff like that, very few people see the point of a Wi-Fi fridge or a lot of these Internet of Things products. But this is a light switch. And switches, well, switches are easy. And everyone understands what a switch is. And whether you need your light bulbs to change colour or not, everyone understands that they do turn on and off. And you do have to get up from the comfy sofa to do so. And if an app can do that instead, well, maybe it's worth £179. It's not, but maybe it is. But there's more to it than that, because you can connect them to the internet, and you can have them turn on for you when you come home, which is what I do. Uh, you can flash, have them flash when the ISS goes overhead, um, or they can tell you who won a sport match or something like that. So they're much cleverer than just the light bulb. And so we have, but we have, so we have this tendency to call this sort of device uh, the Internet of Things. <laughs> Which is a silly name, really, because we might as well have just called them Wi-Fi controlled switches. But unfortunately, we didn't. Now, some people might think I'm being a bit simplistic, but it's true. Most Internet of Things devices are just switches in some form or another. Sure, some stream back video or boil the kettle or organise for Amazon to send you some toilet rolls. But at the end of the day, it's just programming. It's just a flow of decisions. And a decision is a switch. And as we know, switches are easy. And so while the Internet of Things brings up this mental image of something expensive with over-the-top packaging that you can only get from the Apple store, it's quite possible to build something for £3 and get it to do exactly what you want. Except, you'll have to do a bit of fiddling around at the moment. So I'm going to talk about MicroPython, uh, because it's the easy way into it, and because it's a Python conference. So you might know MicroPython from the BBC Microbit, Microbit project, uh, and it allows you to write Python code that runs on microcontrollers. Um, it's a lean version of Python 3 that's been designed from scratch for micro microcontrollers. So as I understand it, it's been completely re-implemented. Um, and it's great because it means we can do really cool things on microcontrollers in the language we all love. Uh, and with the Raspberry Pi Foundation and Code Club both teaching a lot more people Python these days, it's, it's something which more people are learning and more people know Python. And hopefully this can help people do new things that they never would have dreamed of before. And it's an easy way into building physical products. It's still a bit fiddly because this sort of thing's still quite new when it comes to um, Python. And it's something which we're actually talking about a few minutes ago. And hopefully over the next year it will come a bit better and things that we ported across and with things like the micro bit will become easier because kids are going to use it. Hopefully some of that stuff can get ported over and we can end up with a really nice product. But, you know, it's getting there. So let's look at what our ideal Internet of Things device is. It wants to be disposably cheap because if we're going to have a light bulb, I know they're expensive, but, you know, you don't want that to be the main cost of the item. We want it to be able to use Python because we're Python developers. It wants to be low power because we don't want to suck a load of power out of our light bulb or anything, or if we want to run it off batteries. It wants to be open source just because we like open source. It wants to be small because if it's going to fit in a light bulb, it doesn't need to be that big. 
We want access to Wi-Fi because, to be honest, we, get, we use Wi-Fi to get data in and out of everything these days. And it wants GPIO pins so we can control other electronic components and other devices and things like that. So let's look at how we've done this in the past. And back in the olden days in the 1990s, now I don't remember a lot before this, but it's also the decade where computers went from that sort of room-sized box the bank used to print your statement out to the box that you had in your living room, you looked up your statement online. And so we have the PIC microcontroller, which I'm sure many people have heard of. It was very cheap, about a pound each. Uh, they're tiny, they're low power, they have lots of pins on them, but they weren't Python compatible. They're not open source by a very long way. They're very expensive compilers for them back in the day. They've, cleared, they've sorted things out a bit more now, but, and they didn't have access to Wi-Fi, partly because it hadn't been invented then. Um, but if you saw any sort of sci-fi TV show in the 90s and someone had flickering lights, then it was probably built with a PIC chip. So in the mid-2000s, mid I know I'm skipping ahead a bit, there were some people who wanted to get hold of fast, cheap computing power and do cool things. And so we ended up with the rise of the hackers and the Arduino. Now, the Arduino, this is obviously the development board. Uh, the little chip that fits in them uh, is about a pound each, so that is, fits are disposably cheap. They're small, as you can see, it's not very big. Um, they're low power, they use very small amounts of power. They have GPIO pins, and they're open source, at least the Arduino frameworks are. Um, but they're not Python compatible, and they don't have access to Wi-Fi from the go. You can make them access to Wi-Fi, but you know. So then, our fruit-based computing friends came along, and as Philips were wowing us all with their wonderful expensive light bulbs, uh, Raspberry Pi came along. And this was different for one major reason to the others. There wasn't any C, unless you really want to write some C. And C's not so good for prototyping stuff and doing stuff quickly. I use Python because it's quick and it's easy to do what I want to do. It's easy to get some data, to process it, and to put it out in another format. And so with that, that um, familiar interface of sort of Linux and using Python and stuff like that, that means that we could start to build things without any of that mess and confusion that happened beforehand. And so it makes it very useful for bringing the sort of prototyping and physical computing to a new audience. And particularly, as uh, the Raspberry Pi Foundation have, bringing it to kids as well, who are, I mean, I remember when I was at school playing with um, a, a railway level crossing that we had that you could control from some very basic computer thing. And it wasn't that good, but now you can do anything. So the Raspberry Pi B, um, yes, it has pins. Yes, it's Python compatible. Yes, it has open source um, software. And yes, it has access to Wi-Fi if you plug in the USB. But it's not disposably cheap. It's not that small. I mean, they're still tiny, and they still wow as to how much you can do with a tiny little thing. But they're quite big compared to a light bulb. And they're not that low power. If you try and run one of these off a battery, you're going to get maybe a couple of hours if you're lucky. And so the Raspberry Pi Zero came along. These are disposably cheap. They're four pound each. I mean, that's still a bit, but it's not too bad. Uh, they are small, still not tiny, but they're still quite small. They have the pins, they're Python compatible, they're open source, they have Wi-Fi, but again, they're still not quite low power enough. You're still gonna only get maybe 10 hours running on a battery. What we really needed was something that was cheap that does everything. And something we could truly build into products, something that was small and cheap, and just capable enough, and something that could be programmed using our favorite languages. And as ever, China stepped up to the fore, and we have the ESP8266 chip, which does everything we want. Uh, it's disposably cheap, £1.35. It has everything else that did originally say £1.20. That's how much it's gone up. <laughs> um, and in fact, my tech says they're available in just over a pound in bulk, which, yeah, so things have changed. But they operate on three volts, so you can use them with normal batteries. They're tiny, they come in lots of different variants with different numbers of pins and all this sort of stuff. And they're originally sold as Wi-Fi chips, basically as plain Wi-Fi chips. And they could be used with a Raspberry Pi or an Arduino to provide Wi-Fi. But some clever people realised 
and it was also easy to program the inbuilt mi microcontroller. And this is stuff which all happened without any help. Little or much. I mean, they've just released a new one. Currently, there are no English spec sheets for it or anything like that. And everybody's trying to hack away and make everything run on that as well. Um, but they also have the benefit that they have the low power modes that Arduinos have, which means if we're building something like an Amazon Dash button, which I'll come to in a minute, you don't want that to be wasting batteries all the time. You want it to wake up when you press the button, send off a message, and then go back to sleep again. So how do we build a Dash button? They've been around for a while in the US. But they've just become very big in the UK because they just launched them over here. But in the US, they're even available in an Internet of Things version, which just calls the URL on AWS, basically. So let's think about how we would make it. We need the ability to connect to our home Wi-Fi. We want a customizable URL to happen when we press the button. They want a long battery life because we want them to just sit there and forget about them. And we want the ability to brand them because we like toilet roll manufacturers to pay for them. So Amazon needs something cheap, basically, that they can just give away. The headline price of them is $4.99, but that's refunded off your first order, so they're effectively free. But Amazon are a huge company, and even back in 2012, creating something as simple as this for a price that we could considered free wasn't possible to anyone but huge manufacturers. But thanks to things like the ESP chips, we now can do it. So let's look at what we need. We care about it being supposedly cheap and small and Wi-Fi and low power and GPIO pins. We don't really care about the languages so much for Amazon. But you can see how this is basically the list we had before. And if we look at the cost of these things, well, these are prices from China. I checked these yesterday on AliExpress. Um, some of them are as part of a larger bulk cost, but you're not going to spend more than 20 quid to get everything there, and then you can build multiples. And yes, I've got a 3D printer, that's cheating a little. Um, but as you can see, it's not that expensive. They have a microphone in them, they have a programmable LED in them, they have a switch. Nothing there is particularly exciting apart from the microcontroller. But a dash button at the end of the day is just a switch, and we know that switches are easy. Except the dash button is a Wi-Fi switch. And Wi-Fi is less easy. Um, specifically because, how do we tell the device which Wi-Fi network to talk to? And if any of you have got any sort of Internet of Things devices, you go through this process where they start up a little network and you connect to the network and then you have to pick your network and type in the address and, and, then, and then eventually it all works. So we need to be able to do that. So I built a library to do this. Um, so if you're a developer, you obviously just set this in code anyway. But if you're easy, you need a better way of doing it. So the library I've written basically broadcasts an access point. You connect to it, you choose your network, and you type in the key, and then it saves it down to the local storage. And basically, what you then do is start it up the next time. If the network's there, it connects to it. And uh, other than that, it just sort of, yeah. Sorry. Um, so I've got some more code to add to that as well. So if you have a look at that, uh, you'll find how I built a dash button, basically. But after that is just a switch, and switches are easy. And in all honesty, once you've got the Wi-Fi bit working, you can follow pretty much any guide on MicroPython and learn how to detect when someone presses a button, how you want to light up an LED. And with most programming, you can just learn to plug sections together and end up with something cool. And at the end of the day, cool things are quite cheap. Programmable LEDs don't sound that exciting, but if you think, get a few of them, you can make a tube status display or something like that for four quid. LCD displays, you think of them as being these horrendously expensive things. They're really not. You can get a phone module for eight quid, and that allows you to you know, connect anywhere in the world to anything. So none of this stuff is expensive, and it means you can do, you can just let your imagination go wild. So, what are my tips for it? Well, having a vague idea of electronics is obviously a big help. Um, generally, apart from lithium-ion batteries, nothing's going to dangerously blow you up. But, you know, don't be afraid to tinker with things, basically. At the worst, you'll have to replace an LED or two, and I've blown up LEDs, and, you know, it's a pain, but you just replace it. 
Uh, companies like Pimeroni and Adafruit, if you've heard of them, uh, they both sell a lot of particularly Raspberry Pi based things for Pimeroni and Adafruit tend to focus more on um, uh, Arduino. But they're awesome websites and they're awesome companies. They build libraries, they build products that help you build cool things and help you through that, that sort of process. Especially if you're not good with electronics or you're not happy with buying random things from China, they're really good companies to look out for. And most of the stuff you can find out there anyway has a library already. I mean, even the SP8266 MicroPython stuff, which is fairly new, you can go and find anything pretty much. Someone's already written screen controllers and everything else. So where do I get inspiration for things? Well, my friends have come up with ideas. I built an automated cat feeder, post box checker for my friend who lives on the third floor flat, wants to know when his post arrives. A friend of mine got rid of all his cassette tapes. What an MP3 player to have all those cassette tapes built into a cassette tape. Um, Hackaday. <laughs> Hackaday has lots of really interesting things on it. It's a great website full of people doing random, ridiculous things. But go and look there, you'll get lots of inspiration. Uh, you can copy Amazon or Philips uh, to make dash button or LEDs. And watching sci-fi because, to be honest, most of the world, like iPads and iPhones, all comes from what we did in sci-fi anyway. Or you can build the XKCD phone. <laughs> um, just a quick plug, I work for Leto, we're a digital innovation partner, and we've been working with like Admiral and British Museum to come up with some awesome products. And if you want to get in touch with me, there's some get in touch with things, and you come and find me and give me a shout. Or if anyone's got any questions now, feel free to ask. I'm aware of. Um, I mean, to be honest, especially with the SP stuff, it varies between which which batch you buy. So it's not even something you can be particularly sure of. But I mean, they're fairly limited with RAM, obviously. But especially when running MicroPython. But a lot of it's just trial and error, to be honest. Yeah. Have you done anything with hacking dash buttons? Not yet, no. I've got one, but I, ha I only had it about a week, so I need to play with it a bit more. Any more questions? Okay. I've got a question. Oh, yeah? Um, so I know nothing at all about um, electronics. Uh, we had to be, 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 uh, be wire plugs at school, and that, that scared me. Uh, where, <laughs> where do I begin? Um, to be honest, I just followed a lot of the stuff. Again, like I said, on like Adafruit and stuff like that. They take you through some of the some of the sort of basics of the devices that they have, um, but there's loads of stuff out there. If you look at any of the sort of uh, Raspberry Pi tutorials and stuff like that, they will help you out because they're designed for kids, and it's a really easy way to get into it. And I mean, I have a I'm a I have a ham radio license, so I have lots of uh, I have to have electronics experience for that, but I don't know that much. So, you know, it's just a matter of, it's fairly simple, really. Yeah? And what's the point of view on security concerns of the Internet of Things? When somebody hacking your light bulbs and doing crypto disco, it's kind of madness. <laughs> but, for example, if somebody hacking your oven, it can, uh, can be pretty dangerous for your household. Well, I mean, it's with everything, isn't it? Security is just one of those things. And... I mean, for example, <laughs> for example, the ESP8266 chip doesn't support um, SSL by default, so obviously that's a slight issue. But um, <laughs> but you know, things will get better. And yes, I mean, you just have to use your sense, don't you? Really, I mean, if you're going to start putting your oven on the Wi-Fi, then you need to be thinking about it. But generally, don't. <laughs> So, yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. Okay. Thank you.